So do you mean about the writing? And what, 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 how I remember, you, how, how okay, I remember. How did you do this? Well, let's just talk about it. I remember the first time I heard it was when you did a demo of it for me. I came over to your flat in, in Leighton. Mm -hmm. um, and you'd sort of done a kind of like a, a quite simple sort of four track thing, like guitar and drums and stuff. And, uh, and I remember it being a, a, actually quite an exciting. It felt really like it was like, okay, this is quite special actually. I remember kind of taking it away and writing words to it and stuff. But that was, that was the first time I heard it, and that must have been, must have been about 1990, I would have thought. Sometime in 1990, 1991. 91 like must have been, yeah. It's 91? Yeah, probably 91. Yeah, Maybe early yeah, 91. Yeah, 91, definitely. Yeah, because we had it, you know, we, pl we started playing it live in some of those poorly attended shows like uh, uh, Yulu and uh, do you remember the, uh, yeah. when the Teenage Fan Club were playing in the main hall and yeah. we played in the, li in the little <laughs> bit and we played to about four people there and it was really depressing. But that yeah. was one of the songs we played. Right. I don't remember that. Do you remember that? No. Do you remember writing, writing your bit for it? Um, yeah, I mem what I remember about it is I remember it having a key change at first and then it didn't work, I didn't, I sort of wheedled my way out of it. Really? But I remember the first time, yeah, the whole thing was that the chorus was going to be a key change. So originally it was an E. Um, and then actually I changed it to A, but then, so, that the chord, so that then the chorus would go to A. Oh, okay, that's interesting. I don't remember that. I never heard that version of it, I don't think. Yeah, I don't think you did, yeah. But yeah. I remember that always sticks in my head. Yeah. How I didn't man manage to make that work. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember, I remember being at the premises um, in one of the rooms. I remember pl uh, trying it out there, yeah, for the first time. Yeah. Um, and when the vocal came back, that must have been pretty special. Um, we didn't really record sort of demos in those days, though. So the first yeah, time you heard it would have been just sort of really rough in a rehearsal room. No, I we remember didn't. you having it at your flat in um, um, what's the road called? Morehouse, Morehouse Road. Morehouse Road. Yeah. yeah. I remember you having it there and playing it to me. Yeah. I yeah, did. I so that. I did do a little demo of it. <coughs> you I did definitely. Did, yeah. Heard and I heard the Fox <coughs> thing or something. Yeah. And I remember hearing the words and something to do with a gun, generally. And I thought, <laughs> so, oh. phew, well, here we go. Nice. Yeah, yeah, guns now. <laughs> uh, it sticks in my, yeah, no, it sticks in my mind hearing it there. Yeah. And, and thinking about the words, thinking, okay, something to do with a gun, or whatever. I mean, yeah, you say it was called The Drowners, and it's like, well, why? Because it's something to do with guns. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. But, um, and, uh, yeah. but yeah. I wrote a lot of, <coughs> lot of the words to the first album in, 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 the, in the flat. That with a gun to your head. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> In in Morehouse, a place called Morehouse Road, in, in sort of not not far from where I live now, actually, a little flat. I used to share with my friend Alan, kind of mad little flat, and just sitting there, kind of writing all these crazy words. Um, <laughs> and so let's do the, talk about the B sides. Um, the Drowners is supposed to be the um, Children of the Revolution, something like that. That's where it came from for me. It's something with big block chords. Everything before that. The year and a half before that, we've been writing things that were quite florid. Is is one of your words? One of or one of your lot would say that, or would have said that at the time. And cathedrals of noise and all that kind of stuff, and uh, and uh, everything was quite florid in both of what we were doing. So we both became quite uh, cliche number two primal about everything. So he started writing about guns. Yeah. As opposed to sort of flowers or something, and and, yeah. and, and I started stopped doing lovely uh, major sevenths, and started doing well. The, what's the most primal chord in the world? Just an A major, hit with a really. I think we, sort of, we sort of decided to kind of <coughs> embrace sort of rock music a bit, didn't we? In a way, I think before we, you know, everything we'd written was quite sort of apologetic and. Sort of Smith C and stuff like that, and we kind of like we, with the Drowners was one of the first thing. It was like, oh, this is kind of our thing, even though obviously it had, it had a it had a kind of influence from, from 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 other things. It felt kind of very much like, oh, this is kind of swayed now, rather than us sort of trying to be some someone else sort of thing. I don't think we were very good at doing quite elaborate um, uh, melodic music, no. and I think people who do that just. Uh, um, well, well, basically, you, you, your words anyway weren't 
exactly. Uh, um, there was too many odd references anyway. There's yeah. too much Momus influence there at was, that point. Yeah. But yet you were in a song in a sort of lilac time way, or we, well, actually the music was more like that, more that kind of melo that kind of melodic sort of um, style. But yeah, the lilac time was something at that time would have done and would have done really well and pulled off really well. And when we tried to do it, it just was a bit inept. And mm. we had a drum machine as well, so we didn't have a real drummer no. at that time. And so uh, when we got Simon and after that point, um, everything became a little bit more, um, I think we just stopped trying to do that. I stopped trying to write thing. I stopped trying to play guitar in the way that Johnny Marr would have played it on records in a quite subtle way and quiet way and started thinking about the way he played it when I saw the Smiths live. And I think that, I, th I had that realization after Mike Joyce came and played with us and um, joined us for about two days or something. Yeah. But we played with him and had this little uh, flirtation with him and, um, and it reminded me of playing, of going to see the Smiths in 86 when everything was really primal and all the lovely little parts that he'd play would be actually played in one sweeping uh, chord instead. And um, I think that coincided with just our lives became a bit more sort of um, uh, fraught at that time. Mm -hmm. And... Um, it was getting a bit desperate, wasn't it? I think when we first started, we, it, was like, it, was, it was almost like this little hobby we were doing. And by that point, by this point, we were getting sort of sick of, of, of no one really caring about us and not getting anywhere. And I think it was almost like this sort of, you know, right, let's fucking just write something angry and sort of powerful and in your face sort of thing. And it was almost like a, a reaction to that, wasn't mm. it? You know. Yeah, we definitely became more interested in, in sort of if we're going to be humiliated here, we're going to be really, you know, it's going to be quite awful, and uh, you know, and that's a that's a. I mean, it sounds a comedy thing, but but when you start taking in, you know, in rock history, when you start taking, we didn't, we weren't aware of this or thought this through, but when when anybody starts taking risks in anything, that's when you know something good starts to happen, you know. And when you when you set yourself apart, when you're post something as well, when you realise that you're 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 you, you, when you're trying to join in with a crowd, you really have to be quite good at it to assimilate. If you're not, you have to really set yourself apart. And we weren't very good at, at fitting in no. with with the crowd that was exactly. there. You um, know, and it's, I think as soon as we realised that that our strengths were in not fitting in rather than trying to fit in, that's when we, then it started to fall into place. Yeah, that's you know, it. As soon as we started opposing things rather than trying to go with them. Mm. You know, that was a key moment, I think. And The, Drown and the Drowners was, was obviously a, a key, massive, massive song for us in our, in our, in our uh, kind of like, gen you know, and our kind of like learning how to write songs. It was a kind of a real, it was, like, it was the first time the door had been opened. It was like, oh my God, you know, this is it. See the Birds is a bit of a shoey hangover. Yeah. It's got a little, va little vestige of shoegazing yeah, it's still yeah, there. Nice. And, um, and again, done in a fairly inept way. <laughs> the but way but I actually think because it's it's sort of done by a band that can't naturally do that. There's something really interesting. I mean, it's just such a it's a really powerful song. I think. Yeah. And I, I, don't, I actually don't think the, the recording of it ever quite did it justice. To be honest. Wasn't uh, it unlike a double the Drowners. Head? Yeah, exactly. It was. Yeah. Unlike the Drowners, which is a great recording, but to the birds, sort of the recording of that particular song, it, it, it's just it's not as kind of mm. as it should be primal. I, mean, I think I've got a feeling we're going to use this word quite a lot. So let's just embrace it. Um, not as primal as it, as it should have been, but um, I don't remember much about this song, for, to be honest. What do you remember? Well, I, I remember, I remember this being around Rowan. before. Did we write the, it at the premises? Um, yeah, and it was around before The Drowners, and it was. Um, was it? Yeah. yeah. See, I think this one is a bit more literal than The Drowners, and, um, and it, that's why when you wrote The Drowners, um, it was much more abstract for me and away from, completely away from anything I'd heard you sing before. Mm. And uh, whereas To The Birds was still had one foot in um, uh, personal yeah, it did, that yeah. I understood. Yeah, it did, exactly. You know, like something that I actually, it was almost biographical. Yeah, it was. Yeah. And, um, and The Drowners, I, didn't, I couldn't really connect that. Yeah. And so that's, which is part of it. But I think To The Birds is a bit more, is much more emotional, much more yeah. uh, biographical. And um, but yeah, it was a very po powerful. It was very. I remember. Yeah, I used to always finish it. It was a big sort of uh, 
uh, as a yeah, but we didn't didn't really pull off the recording no. of it all. A but closing song. It was, a, it was a really important closing song, yeah. yeah. And um, my abiding memory of playing to the birds live was during that time in New York when Matt fell down the, that hole <laughs> in the stage. <laughs> Hilarious. Ends up playing his bass like this. Yeah. Stomping away at the big coda and suddenly... Oh yeah, 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 I do remember that. It was a good play, though. Uh. My insatiable one, I remember exactly right, and we were in the premises and the other two didn't turn up. And, I was, exactly and, it, and yeah. I was with my mate Paul, who I lived with at the time, yeah. and he'd given me the lift there. I remember standing there and I had the riff of it, and I wanted to do something where it changes from a major to a minor mm -hmm. at the end, because mm -hmm. I'd been listening to Frank Sinatra or something, and I thought, that's what proper... Summer loving or something like that. Something like that, like that yeah. <laughs> but that's what proper songwriters yeah. do, you know. And, um, and uh, I remember that really clearly, doing that, and you, I'm just playing it to you, and the two of us working it out on the spot. I remember, no, you're absolutely right, it was just me and, me and Bernard sitting there, and, and, that, uh, and it came about because, for some reason, both of them, the other two cancelled, didn't they? They were both ill or something like that, and we were like, well, yeah. what should we do, let's write a song. And we sat there, and we, and we actually wrote, I remember I actually kind of wrote kind of my whole, my whole bit, bit of it, kind of while Bernard was there, and I just sort of took it away. And, and sort of, sort of um, fine-tuned the lyrics, but yeah, that was one of those kind of real <coughs> moments, wasn't it? Where it was just sort of suddenly, we, five, you know, half an hour earlier, we, we didn't have a song, and then we suddenly had this song. It's like, oh wow, that's lovely. A beauty of songwriting when that sort of thing happens, you know, it's a lovely, it's like the Doors movie, isn't it, when they're doing Light My Fire. Not always like that. Mm. <laughs> yeah, again, it is very, again, really, again, you've got to remember what all the indie music was like at that time. Everything was covered in reverb and very obscu uh, obscure chords and as interesting sort of layers of chords as you could get in everything and, and, and vocally as well, backing vocals and all sorts of things. And um, again, it's an, it's an A major and a D major. It's really simple uh, first position chords uh, with, the, with the, the riff. I think I was developing my own kind of like, you know, sort of little lyrical world as well. It was kind of, it's quite sort of sexual, but quite kind of, but not sort of like LA cartoon sexual. It's sort of like, sort of slightly quirky English sort of sexual, isn't it? And, and kind of sort of odd little song about loss and all these sorts of things, but set in a particularly British context. I used to really love this song because we, because it was really pretty and not, so there's nothing pretentious about it at all. It probably is the most, uh, uh, on a suede level, it's not that pretentious anyway. And, um, but um, it's, it's really, uh, it just feels like it, feel, it had a sort of a classic song feel about it. But I really remember the lyric about the, um, um, the uh, what's the lyric? <laughs> I don't remember it now. Oh, about being on the, uh, I just, on the escalator. I, on the escalator, but I have a real image, because I remember I was just spend most of our lives on the on tube, escalators, yeah. on escalators, walking up and down in brown flares. And, that, and, that, and every time I think of that, I still th see yeah. that exact image, because that's what um, life was like. And at that time, uh, we were sort of quite um, different. And, um, and I think that sort of fed a lot of these weird songs but you know, at the end of the day, they're not actually weird songs at all. It's just that everything else around was quite weird. I, I thought everything else was quite weird, and that what we were doing wasn't weird. Yeah, and but I now think uh, this seems quite weird. Well, some, some, yeah, it does. But then, but it's all very melodic. 
Yeah, know, it's very tuneful. Yeah. It's not like weird. It's in not. The sense some, that it's not kind of like sort of willfully obscure or anything, is it? Quite yeah. the opposite. I mean, that's exactly, the whole point. Yeah. We were trying to write very sort of sort of simple melodic pop songs, and they weren't trying to be arty at all. You know, or not in the kind of art school manner. It was kind of our own little version of artiness, I suppose. You know. Sheep Sheep song? Yeah. yeah from, from my point of view, it's the Sheep Sheep song. It's the share version though. And uh, I remember watching, um, I really liked the Sheep Sheep song when it. I remember seeing it. I remember my girlfriend, who ended up, um, is it my wife, um, she said, oh, but you, you know, you listen to the wrong version and hearing uh, the 60s version. But I always loved the Shoop Shoop song by Cher. I just loved that, mm. the beat. And I would always just referenced the drum beat and it had a sort of Motown drum beat, which I'd always wanted to do on something. And... Um, <laughs> Is it in his eyes? Somewhere. Is that, does that make any sense at all? <laughs> kind of. Is it? It's the drum beat, really. But I remember being on the tube coming over from one of the rehearsals. And I used to live in uh, Leighton and uh, spent my life on the Central Line. And I remember, yeah. I remember, I just remember standing there listening to that on my Walkman and really imagining it and just thinking, right, I'm going to. That's, that's what I want, this kind of uh, riff, and uh, going home and doing it. We got on the way to rehearsal or not, or something. We used to spend our lives on the central line, because I, I lived in Notting Hill, and he lived in Leighton, so it was kind of like... And we rehearsed in Bethnal Green. We rehearsed in Bethnal Green, yeah. so it's kind of like, literally didn't spend any time in any other line except the central line. We should have some sort of loyalty card or something. <laughs> yeah. We? yeah, oyster platinum. <laughs> <laughs> I think you started this song. Yeah, exactly. It's some weird little thing that I, I had. Some, and I think we were just looking for B-sides. We didn't. I think what we what we done, we, we were we slightly pissed off that, that we'd wasted to the birds and mine station one as B-sides. And I think we were looking for something that didn't weren't re, like potential real things that we were going to get pissed off about having lost them. And I had this like, little weird thing on the on the guitar and, and Bernard sort of. Uh, Took it somewhere else, and I think the same sort of thing with "He's Dead." I had this sort of thing with a kind of a couple of odd chords, and you and you brought that guitar part to it and completely changed it. And "He's Dead" actually became, I think, a really special song. Actually, quite a, quite a sort of defining song. Funnily enough, it became a really great live song from being this kind of like shabby little odd thing that I kind of came up with. But yeah, those those, those two are, are a bit of an anomaly actually. I was saying the other day they're the only only two in the whole whole this, whole this canon that sort of didn't. Come about, and I think in, the, in that in that sort of with that formula, the way we were writing yeah. at the time. Yeah, that's true. But he's dead. What we had before, because it had like the indie dance beat. Oh, we did. Yeah, we, we did. No, you're had right. It was baggy. Are you right? Yeah. Because I used to sing with that megaphone. Did you? Was that so? Did you used to have that guitar? So that was before you wrote that the guitar part then. You re, we re, yeah, we before I wrote the lead guitar we? part, yeah. Okay. Yeah, right. it was more. I'm getting confused. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, definitely. It was because that made it for me. Then, that, as soon as you yeah. wrote that guitar part, suddenly it was like, okay, well, it was slowed down. And basically, song. it was the drum beat from Tomorrow Never Knows. That's right. Yeah. And and then that was it. But that um, that single, I, when I look at that, they're actually, they're actually really good songs, and um, that was a really good time, and. Um, 
the sleeve's not as good, <laughs> which really puts me off. Whenever I think of that, uh, think of that in my mind, that record, I think of the sleeve and it's not as good as the first one. And the first one has just got an amazing sleeve and everything yeah, about good, it. it? Yeah. And that everything is absolutely in its right place. But actually, He's Dead is a much better uh, song. That, well, it could be, could be on the first, uh, I don't, don't know about that, but it could be on the first single. I like, I like that you were trying to write B-sides, but they were just too good. <laughs> just I mean, th songs. We, we definitely wrote... Um, didn't write, write B-sides, just we allowed it to go out and it, at the, you know, because it was still the age of vinyl where, where you had B-sides and B-sides and putting out a single, you knew that that's all people would get to hear for a few months or whatever and, and, and you had to just, you couldn't say, oh, but we've got better songs in our album, you know, you, you couldn't take the risk. So we just wanted to have the best songs. Yeah, it was so important at the time that, that, that I think we just lived in this sort of microscopic world that was, you know, the London music scene and the NME. That was the kind of like world we were living in you know, and the Melody Maker sort of thing. And, you know, it, it, if we weren't putting out, you know, we didn't have to think about oh, international sales or it wasn't like that, you know. And, and it was so key for us to be putting out things that people were excited about all the time. And the idea of putting out something with, B, with substandard B-sides was kind of, you know. Also, I mean, it's the, the Smith thing is the, of, of having great B-sides and the records are complete. They're not, they're, they're, you know, every track's totally vital. And I remember when we first met, this is one of the things we talked about. Like, we talked about William, it was really nothing. And how that had, how soon is now, and please, 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 on the back. And, that's an amazing 12 inch. Best EP of all time. Yeah, it is. And, and mm. you know, and How Soon Is Now was just a B side chucked away, you know. Yeah, I mean, that's just crazy. And, um, and that, that was, you know, all these things were um, um, a big inspiration, you know. And I, I think at the time you, you sort of were, I was, I was slightly concerned of being too reverential and too literal about these things. And um, because you, you're not sure where your personality is yourself. And actually, further down the line, you think, actually, that was. These things are such a good move when you take these inspirations and put them into your own sort of world. But um, Mel Mickey also, uh, that song, I mean, where did we play that? Did we play that live? We, we recorded day? that three times. Oh, we re-recorded it. Yeah, yeah I remember we recorded it three times. We recorded it at Protocol and then we re-recorded yeah. it because it was rubbish. Yeah. It was kind of really soft and it was like status quo or something. We kind yeah. of like, we sort of, it was like lots of overdub guitars, but it should have been yeah. primal. Yeah. To sort of reuse the word. Yeah, I remember we recorded it at the end at Maison Rouge. Oh, yeah, that's right, we recorded it. Yeah. And uh, um, we went on a tour around that time, which is the best thing, well, I did with the band anyway, which is we went to Scotland, I remember, <laughs> and um, Green, like in a minibus. And uh, it was the best gigs. They, uh, it was just amazing. Yeah, they were great. Ab everything was absolutely perfect. That was the best time. Little, and those little songs. White transit van driving up to Glasgow. Yeah, we didn't have some of the songs there, but we had uh, most of those songs. We were basically playing those two sort of twelve inches and a few other songs, and um, and it was amazing fun. That so was before like, Animal Night. We wrote Animal Night, right? Yeah, like in October, November, or whatever yeah. that year. We would have had things like Moving and uh, Animal Lover and yeah, stuff like and that. Yeah, and Pantomime Horse. Pantomime Horse, yeah. And, um, yeah, any band, that that's, that's the moment when it's just, you can't take that away, really. It's, it's just, it's, it's never as good in any way, I don't know. Yeah. For anybody, it's just, there's, there's nothing you can, you can beat about that. It's like sort of meeting someone for the first time or something like that. It's that kind of thing. Yeah. That kind of moment of sort of falling in love for the first time. You can never, yeah. you can never get that back in a way. It's, but yeah, it's just, yeah. I remember playing the place in Edinburgh and um, people were literally at my, my eyeball to eyeball like that and uh, my, some pedals down there behind somebody and it's just brilliant fun. Just the best fun in the world. Just loud and, you know, really funny. Do you, the, do you remember we played at a place called the Rumble Club in, in Tunbridge Wells? And oh, yeah. There wasn't a stage, yeah. so we were literally the only thing that separated the crowd from the audience was a sort of like a, was it like a little rope or something like yeah. that? Yeah. It was really odd. So it being exactly the same level as the crowd. Yeah. I remember Bath playing Moles. Metal Mickey. I remember playing Metal Mickey there. Bath Moles are running playing like that. Yeah. That's like that. But this was sort of like before. The hysteria, actually. It was almost when it was sort of bubbling up, but it was before it went really, really mad. It's quite weird to know that anybody had heard of us, let alone people in 
Uh, it's quite sort of, not jolly, but kind of, I can't think of the word, you know. I don't know if that was a... No, it's teen no. spirit. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I remember, again, my wife uh, said we got this re got teen spirit. I remember her playing teen spirit, saying this is just an amazing record. I'd never heard Nirvana at that time. It was, I'd, so, uh, yeah. and just hearing that, I'm just thinking it was just the riff, the fact that it starts with a big guitar riff. Just that opening riff, just something that just tears, sort of blows you away from as a as a big riff, big distorted guitar riff. Yeah, but I didn't like the I didn't like the sound of of uh, Nirvana. I thought it was kind of at that time. I thought, is this a heavy metal band? Or I didn't really get why every what every loved about it. But I got that that people that it crossed over, and for some reason people were loving this band. Like I couldn't get why it was being talked about as, an, as sort of an indie group. But yeah, it sounded like a heavy metal record to me at that mm. time because things had changed a lot in the way things sound, and that heavy metal kind of ended, didn't it? And um, yeah, it's much more acceptable to write kind of like out and out rock music now, isn't it? But yeah. at that time. It was kind of, you know, there was still that kind of like slight suspicion of rock. I mean, yeah, I mean, the know. drums in it, I mean, are just massive, you know, it's almost like 80s heavy metal drum sound. And, um, mm. and uh, so, I mean, I just wanted to write something that, that had that effect, that, that had that sort of, um, um, you know, the riff that it just started and you knew it straight away. Was it easy to write a vocal? No, it took me ages to get it. Actually, it, 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 I, I had it. Like Bernard says, it was you know the piece, the music was. They were playing it in the rehearsal room for ages, and I was sort of sitting there. And I couldn't crack the nut. And it did t take quite a while. I don't know what. I think maybe I just got the melody first, which is sort of woven around the. Ding, do, 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 do. And then once I got that piece in place, you know, I, I never, I never sort of. I always kind of start with the melody, and then kind of the, the lyrics sort of come after that, really. It's, it's rare that they kind of come together, or I, it's rare that I write lyrics and then sort of put them onto a, onto a thing. It's just, it felt, you know, I kind of try and feel how the, how the music feels. You know, it's very important for me not, not to write a lyric that, that has no connection with the, with the music. You know, it feels like it needs to speak in the same way that the music does. And, you know, I was looking for it for quite a long time, but you know, got there in the end. I don't remember hearing that until it, it, we'd finished it hearing the vocals on it, because we recorded it, we, we, yeah, we did... Uh, we, I definitely didn't do a demo of it. On no, we recorded it on, we did that session at Angel and um, in, uh, about, I don't know, November or something of 92. Yeah. And um, we rec I remember doing the backing track there and recording it there, and then, but it was just like, we're going to record this anyway, you know, because yeah, it hoping, wasn't a song that, yet, was it? Yeah, hoping exactly. that it would do something for it. Because at um, that point, we were talking about sleep. We'd just written Sleeping yeah. Pills, hadn't we? And we were talking <laughs> about Sleeping Pills being the, yeah. the next single. Because yeah. we were really proud of that song, weren't we? <laughs> yes. and it was you like may be proud before. of it. <laughs> yeah. It wouldn't well, have been a good single, though, would it? It would, yeah. Yeah, Pain of People's not the best song in the canon, to be honest. It's just a bit of a throwaway one, wasn't that it? That was chucked away, that one. Yeah. yeah. It's just something. It was kind of okay. Like, it was one of those songs that was okay live, wasn't it? And it just sort of like found its way and we were looking for a big yeah. sign. It wasn't. Not, yeah. I'm not especially proud of that. I think big, the big time is, is much more kind of like that, that could have easily been on the first album. I think it's a beautiful song. Uh, it's a, it's it was in that, it was kind of one that we we were we were just looking for a B side there, weren't we? And it sort of turned into something really special. We were kind of looking for it specifically looking for a B side. And it was, yeah. We didn't ever think that it was going to be any good, and it just sort of, you know, I kind of wrote my part to it, and then Ed suggested putting the. Or did you suggest putting the, the horn at the end? I can't remember. Oh, no. Was that one of hers? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I think that really made it. That really made the atmosphere at the end. It's beautiful. Really kind of like a, re a really good move, I thought. It's very simple, sort of the flugel horn, isn't it? Like yeah. Core on that, isn't it? Yeah, really proud of that. So, um... That's really, for, I mean, the timing of that song is really odd as well. Because, um, well, not odd, but just, you know, everything was happening then, and it's quite a... Uh, odd reflective thing to hear coming out of the group, your own group, when that is actually happening. But it's, it's, like, it's like you're in a film and that suddenly comes on during that moment in the film. Yeah. You know, it's very sort of autobiographical, that, the, the lyric to that, you know, it's kind of like very much about what was happening to me and us at the time and how I sort of saw myself as, as being very 
sort of hungry for what was happening and kind of like, you know, almost like, not treading on other people, but you know, yeah, I had friends that obviously, that I had friends who weren't in the band and, and I sort of sensed that, the, the, you know, it was almost like a, a, a sort of slightly reflective thing about how they were, you know, I was losing sight of them because I was disappearing off on this, you know, in this, in, in this, on this, this sort of really crest of this wave sort of thing. So it was a reflective thing about that, in my relationship with them, I suppose, really. Nice. And well, this is one that actually was written sort of while we were making the record, wasn't it? We never played this live before the first album. Never played it like live, that. no, but we played it in rehearsal a lot. Yeah, it was uh, called Stonesy, wasn't it? Stonesy, the demo, yeah. Um, um, yeah, it was... Um... That kind of rhythm. It's a bit more staccato. Right? Yeah, and um, just sort of big chunky riffs, and it was more well, it was more sort of honky tonk women that kind oh, of thing. Right, yeah. um, well, it just didn't really. It was really clunky when we were recording it. I, I mean, I remember being uh, in the studio. Yeah, and it was just. I remember I recorded the rhythm guitar part, and I was going to record these arpeggios as well, and we just took out the. Um, took out the clunky rhythm part and it just sounded so much better and uh, yeah all the way through and did it just sounded more like what we do and um, I mean I just remember being with Ed Buller and, and so, in, so overwhelmed you mean button. I just felt so overwhelmed <laughs> by a lot of what was happening and yeah. by uh, you know by things like that as well that I didn't I just hadn't experienced you know for whatever reason I just hadn't experienced and um, I found that quite overwhelming and I felt that Looking back on it now, when I hear that, you, you could have had a song uh, called So Young or, or, you know, around that kind of, uh, because we're young. Um, and it could have been sort of done by a sort of a baggy band and it would have been a real triumphal sort of um, thing of like getting out of it and stuff. And actually it's a really sad song and it's really beautiful and, and, and really pretty which, and very fragile. Which uh, and basically those words over over music that's quite fragile is uh, is is probably uh, one of the things that makes it for me, you know, because it's because it's not like a it's not like a stone stone roses did they I think they did have a song called so yeah. yeah. but 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 they but it could have been one of their you know big flag waving anthems you know about you know you know let's all get out of it together and actually our, my experience personally at that time was sort of gradually finding the sofa and, and wanting to get underneath it. And and f I felt like that, and so I'm I'm quite happy with with the rest of it. And I just didn't take anything literally. It's supposed to be a it's, it's not it's supposed to be a kind of a song with real duality though. It's not supposed to be. Of course, there's an element. There's a, there's a very wide-eyed, idealistic kind of reflection of what it's like to be young, and this sense that yeah, let's just get out of it. But the whole point is the twist of it, where where the, the code is let's chase the dragon from our home. It's like this kind of like let's reject this. Instead of embrace it, and and take on a take on a kind of like a different version. The opening statement of the band. Yeah. I know it was internationally or whatever. You know what I mean? But because there'd been so much fuss about the drowners and Metal Mickey and Alan Nitro, it felt like we had to sort of do something like that to kind of to say, oh, actually, we're not just this band that writes these sorts of songs. Yeah. You know, let's chuck a bit of piano in there as well. Yeah. I don't know. I th I, I, I think it works in the context of the song. Yeah. I know what you're saying. Yeah, I spoke about the lyrics. I, I remember writing, writing this. Uh, I remember, well, I don't know. I, I remember you playing it to me and you, you had a flat in, in West Hampstead. I remember sitting in your room and kind of coming up with the melody. You no, know, your timeline's gone. Really? Totally, yeah. Yeah. I, def I definitely remember sitting sitting somewhere with, with, in one of your flats. Was yeah, it Camden. not West Hampstead? Camden. Camden. Camden? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm okay. flat in Camden, yeah. Camden, we all live in Camden. Which is Delancey yeah. Street? Yeah, Delancey Street at the top floor flat in Delancey yeah, no. Street. Oh, the was it there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and um, um, yeah, I remember doing, yeah, I was there definitely when we were doing those songs. Um, Breakdown, I remember doing Breakdown in that as well. And She's Not Dead, yeah. 
Yeah. She just got that electric piano for the first time and I'm doing stuff on there. Yeah, I really love um, She's Not Dead. Yeah, it's nice. It's really nice. It's just a really intricate kind of beautiful song. I, I kind of, I think the rhythm section is, is really nice as yeah. well. Bass is lovely and what the drums do. It, it just all kind of combines to make it not just a sort of ballad and what the guitar does with the trills. It used to be called trills, didn't it? Trills, yeah. Yeah, that's the thing, because it was just this... Yeah, twiddly thing. What's that all about? Amazing. I know. Well, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <coughs> Wasn't it? I mean, that's the funny thing about a lot of the. the I don't remember them being being there for the <laughs> mixing of any of this first album. I remember Animal Nitrate, and the only reason I remember it is because I remember us always being in a room because uh, we mixed it in the room next door at Master Art, the SSL. And I remember being there and saw Galpin waiting outside in his car at three in the morning, and is having to. Well, I remember. I remember. He, car, he went out to sit in his car and check it, and we all just stood there, and just like, what? You know, we've got to wait for him to see if he likes it or the not. The man you from know. Del Monte. And he was like that, you know, and we all taking the piss out of him anyway, and he knew it, and, and, but it was just getting really nervous. But I don't remember a lot of being around there for the mixing. So things like what happened in the, the, this big phasing thing that happened in yeah, the middle of moving, just, it just appeared. And, um, I, I, and the same, the piano in So Young, it, it was just so, you know, <laughs> anything like this, you, you can see like a record becomes a record and you accept it for what it is, and it is for everybody else. Like you, the first time you hear it, that's what it was. But if, you, if there's anything that has changed in the meantime, it's, very, it's going to be very hard to, to come to terms with that, knowing that there was something there and it was taken out. So that's why we struggle with that thing on uh, uh, a couple of things there. But, um, Right, but having said that, a lot of the touches, like, and she's not dead, there's this weird sort of uh, uh, spooky sort of synth, which is really great, and um, that's, that's why, and I really love that. Um, what about Pantomime? That's a huge, hugely uh, loved song. Yeah, by, yeah, it's, uh, I, I love Pantomime, it's one of, I think it's one of the, the greatest moments of the, of the, of the band, actually. Which is, Generally, it's just such a special song. It's so sort of, I don't know. Who started it? I remember it being, it wasn't in that time signature when you first Yeah, it, it, it wasn't at first, time. yeah. It was in 4 4, wasn't it? Yeah. And, and the, the reason was because I didn't want it to be that joke isn't funny anymore, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, uh, and, and then just thought, then fuck, we it. thought fuck it. This is <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah. But it doesn't sound. Yeah. So, but the, the key thing is, uh, I, I remember working out legally that I went for went A. If I had that rhythm, I went up to a B rather than down, uh, then it would be fine. So uh, you were writing it with Kaz on the line. <laughs> you know, Kaz on the line. <laughs> no, but we wrote this. Uh, I remember we had this in, when I was living in Leighton, and I remember uh, yeah writing this in the summer. And, which is because it's such a summer song. Isn't no, it? it's, it's like the Beach Boys, isn't it? <laughs> Um, um, but it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful song, and I'm really, really, really proud of it. And I remember playing this when um, there was one person in the room, two people in the room, one was Alan, um, and one was my wife. What a gig. Uh, at the gig at the Falcon, and we swapped sides, because there was a radiator on one side of the um, stage, and me and Matt swapped off. And it was so it, fucking cold, Because it was it? so yeah. cold, yeah. and uh, to stand, and I remember looking up at Lisa every now and then, and she was like that. Du Done yet. Dutifully yeah. sitting there. Can we go out? Yeah. We're going out, aren't we? Oh, dear. <laughs> and, uh, and I remember the very next time we played there, it was Morrissey came, Suggs came, all these yeah, people. Yeah, it was not it? She didn't bother coming. But, um, but I remember having... But uh, the point is of that useless anecdote is that playing Pantomime Horse, a tragic song in 3-4 with this dramatic um, uh, climax and uh, stuff to two people in a bright room yeah, exactly. that's freezing cold. This adds, adds another element to, to the word tragic, doesn't is, it? It's tra tragic in a different way. Yeah, well, you it adds a new <laughs> meaning to you had to be there. Yeah. <laughs> that's 
really but, uh, is the tears of a clown. That really was the, yeah, that's, that's what this band was all about then. Um, I remember recording it just after we'd written it at that place in South London. Somebody from uh, Malcolm Dunbar from East West, West paid for us to yeah. um, record in somewhere in Clapham. Together, yeah, that's right, and I remember yeah. going there on a Sunday mm. and recording it there just after we'd written it that week or something. Yeah. And, uh, so, and that's because he was trying to sign us. And every time right. somebody wanted us to sign us, we said, we're not sure if we could only hear our songs demoed. Yeah, so then, we just um, got loads of free demo time. Then it, it, would, it would make it much clearer. So they paid for us to do demos, which quite cruelly we'd play to other people. Exactly, yeah. Oh well. That's always happened. Exactly. Sorry Malcolm. But, um, yeah, I mean we were incredibly proud of this song when we first wrote it. I remember that. I don't quite remember how we wrote it or where. I don't have a story about that, but I just remember thinking, okay, this is a new sort of, you know, this is something really special and we're, we're, we're you know, we're, we're kind of evolving beyond the, the sort of like, you know, scruffy, grubby little kind of angry guitar song into something more expansive. Um, and something I forgot to mention that was kind of bugging me the other day, we were talking about the, what, was, what the song was about. So many people assume this song is about suicide, and it, and it isn't. It's about kind of like people taking Valium to, it, to just to get through the day sort of thing. You know, it's not, it, it's, people always sort of think that it's got that kind of tragic edge, and it. it's got a different sort of tragedy. It's supposed to be a sort of a... You know, an everyday sort of tragedy. Do you know what I mean? You see, see sleeping pills and think, oh my God, it's about suicide. And it's not. It goes, goes together with uh, my insatiable one for me. Yeah, it probably might have been written uh, not, not, for, not long after, but yeah, very similar, but just slowed down version of it. Are there, um, and, uh, isn't it called, is it called chromatic when you, like, you put chords together that, are from, that aren't from the same, aren't yeah. from the same group? Uh, sort it's of it's when, yeah. There's lots of chromatic. It's mo instead of moving from which is what the Stone Roses would have done. I love the Stone Roses, I'm not putting them down. Uh, I would then play... So it's moving up chromatically there. Right, OK. Yeah. And Sleeping Pool is the same, yeah. There's lots, lots of those things. I got into that in lots of songs. It just sort of has that jolt then, doesn't it? That's yeah. It's really nice, that bit, the bits in the verse, that kind of like the chord goes somewhere where you're not really thinking it's going to go. I thought that was really clever and just, it just added to the atmosphere and took it away from being a kind of... A soft rock ballad, you know, kind of think that the soft rock ballad would have gone to so, and then would have gone to a minor there. I think that's why Suede, Suede could do ballads really well because it, of what the, of the kind of strange chords that Bernard would put in there to just to take them away from the, you know, comfortable territory musically, you know, and I so I could do, you know, croon and pretend to be um, Celine Dion, and uh, it would all somehow not sound like Celine Dion. There's lots of blues chords and stuff, yeah. and everything. Lots of sevenths and uh, and minor sevenths and uh, that follow major chords, and that's what. And lots of semitone moves. What I used to always just think about is semitone. Instead of moving from to there, I'd move. And that's all it is. I think I just did it once and somebody, probably Ed Buller, probably said, that's good, and so I just did it on everything. And it became a style, you know, and, I still do it, and that's still what I do, the way I play now. You know, and it, it's, as soon as you hear anything, little things like that in, in guitar playing become just massive things. Like, it's, it's ridiculous to say that now, like, I'm just going... But actually, that's, that's a massive part of discovering that uh, silly little trick of, of everything I've done. At the same time I bought... Um, uh, well, I remember getting a Les Paul when we were. Um, I mean, getting a Les Paul was quite a, quite a massive thing in, uh, in about 1990, and that you and Justine gave me the money for it. I remember, and I remember going to Luton and getting this Les Paul, and this was a massive thing for me because nobody played Les Paul at the time, and um, and I really wanted a Les Paul. I can't even remember why, but I just wanted one because nobody played them, and people never do still. And then on when we did the first album, 
let's suppose you play in a very, a very macho way. You play, it's, it's unavoidable, they're very, uh, very big sustain, yeah. very, uh, you tend to go for big, strong chords. You don't play in a sort of subtle way. If you have a 12 string or a jazz master, you tend to go for sort of little open, nice loveliness. But with a Les Paul, you just hit an A major. <laughs> And, and you want to hit it loud. Mm. And the same way when we when we're doing the first album, I desperately wanted one of these, um, a three five five with a tremolo, because w when I'd grown up, I'd seen Chuck Berry had one, Roy Orbison had one, and Johnny Marr had had one, and so that's all I wanted. And and this guitar, whenever you play, because it's got a tremolo, it's got this lovely bassy sound for a start. You can't hear it now, but um, it's got this bassy sound, and when you play it with your fingers, it's really. And, and the tremolo just is instant emotion switch if you do it well. And again, nobody just just because simple reason that nobody was doing that, nobody nobody used them. And I got into it, and people because people liked it, and it and it turned a switch with a lot of these songs, you know, all that kind of stuff. It just became like, well, that's what I do, and that's that's what works with everybody. But it really worked. It really offsets because. I think a lot of what Brett was writing about and, and the way he was singing, it's really highly emotional content. I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't know if it's talked about, I don't know if people realise that, but from where we came from, from the previous couple of years, for me it was a really emotional time and really seeing that through. And again, because we were really young and, um, and the content of that and how we changed. And, um, and I, 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 we never spoke about lyrics. I mean, it's probably the first time we've, I've ever spoken about uh, Brett's lyrics, but um, and we certainly would never talk about it at the time, and I never asked because because it, it, it just didn't to me it made no difference. It didn't make any difference just to just to say to start asking. Oh, what's that one about? I'd feel like a real prick. But there was a real bit, uh, this, a lot of the time it frustrated me that I felt like I was being a bit of a um, I was just fairly thick. I felt because I, because I wasn't operating on that level. But I always felt at the time it was cooler to not talk about it specifically, yeah. but to try and interpret what I understood emotionally. Because I understood emotionally up to that point when um, everyone, when we started becoming successful and everyone was talking about it, I felt I understood that more than anybody. I, felt, I definitely felt I understood it more than anyone else in the band. Um, because I felt I was more, much more connected to it, to, yeah, the, gotcha. to, to, to with the greatest respect than Matt and Simon were yeah. specifically. And, um, you know, the way people write songs together in partnerships is always in the understanding that, you, you know, you let something happen and then you just, you look, you look up and you go, <sighs> right, and go away then. And let's, that happened, but, you know. I think the point is with, with sort of lyrics, and I, I can't speak for other writers, but, but you know, saying what, what a song is about is kind of, it's almost like a, a sort of, it doesn't mean anything really. It's like songs, songs are kind of, Obviously, it's, it's so much about the, about the interpretation for me. You know, what I might, might be the starting point for me as a song, as, 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 for a song is irrelevant in a way. It's like how, people, how it reflects off other people. When people come to me and they say, you know, like, oh, that song's about that, and I'm kind of, I kind of nod my head. And like, well, it is for you, and that's really nice. You know what I mean? That's, that's, that's totally cool. Um, I mean, a so lot of the a lot of the things that people, when people started writing about it in a sort of pseudo intellectual way, yeah. I just sort of thought, I don't know what you're on about. I, I really didn't know what they're on about, but they didn't. But the suggestion was that it meant that it meant nothing to me, or that it was just going over my head completely. The lyrics, or you know, it was just like, yeah, whatever, yeah, yeah. Let's get to another solo. Which I found really frustrating because I didn't have the voice to sort of say, you know what, it actually, I know it more than you. I actually understand it much better than you. Well, you'd and, been there and, and you'd, you know, you'd sort of like, you'd, you'd expect, you know, kind of been there one night when, when lots, of the, lots of the situations of this, uh, you know, kind of between sort of 1989 and, and, mm. and 1993 when all those things were happening. Yeah, and you know, you, and you knew the, the personal aspects of the songs, didn't you? Yeah, and also I knew, like we were talking about pantomime horse. I mean, playing that in an empty room. I mean, that's why I'm sort of saying how important that is because that music, the next song would have come out of that situation. The fact that if you come out of that room, playing that gig and playing that kind of song, if you don't pack up and say, actually, you know what, let's, pro let's join a proper band or get a job, then you go on. Then you, you know, you're either stupid or you you go on to try and do something else that's even more ridiculous. You know, because you're getting into that sort of sense of drama and the sort of the, 
uh, emotional power of it, you know, and that's what I felt we did at the time. I felt, I felt us two certainly um, just went away from it and were sort of inspired by it. We, we you know, very sort of, um, came very sort of aggressive about, yeah, very about much a very, very defensive. Strong belief about what we we're doing. Yeah, incredible belief, you know. Yeah. If I could ever, to, if anybody ever asked me what that was like, yeah, I don't even know what, I mean, times have changed and stuff, but, but just that idea of having that belief really does see, see you through, mm. you know, in a, in a way that you can't explain to anybody that really that, that will work for you. But it really did. Yeah, so what did we... This was written so during the album sessions, wasn't it? Yeah, so basically, um, uh, Brett used to have um, Rod Stewart's Greatest Hits, and, um, did, and uh, which uh, was always playing, and and I and it's the pink, one with the pink cover. Yeah, I can see it now. And I dug this out, this, and I was thinking about this morning, and I, and I found my copy of it, and the, the, it used to always play the first cut as the deepest, oh, which, which is, uh, well, oh. all that album is brilliant. The pink, Rod Stewart's Greatest Hits, it's got The Killing of Georgie, yeah. um, I was first cut as the deepest, yeah, all of those. Yeah. And it's really, really amazing record. And um, But we used to listen to that, when we weren't listening to Momus, we were <laughs> listening to Rod Stewart's that was greatest said with, a, with, a, with, a, with a hint of bitterness. <laughs> well, I tried to find Momus this morning. As I well, like some Momus. I know, still. yeah, I yeah, yeah I know. The Poison Boyfriend album's great. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. In fact, have you seen that Primal Scream record? Which is that? You know the sleeve of? Do you know the sleeve of the Poison Boyfriend with him doing that? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. There's yeah. flowers behind him. Yeah, it's, yeah, you're right. Yeah. It's like the new Primal Scream. Record. Yeah, yeah. Don't know if it's yeah. weather. But whatever, love Primal Scream, of course. But you know, just just point it out. I'm sure people have pointed out before. Um, but I remember listening to uh, yeah. Well, anyway, I remember listening to that at the time. And breakdown was called Stuart. That was the uh, it's um, it's uh, like a working title. And uh, yeah, I remember writing that in Camden on a Sunday afternoon. And it was literally written because we needed another song. And um, I remember uh, wanting to write stuff that had a key change in it. And um, that's where it came. I remember writing it Sunday afternoon, yeah. And then, but it was really quickly done. And I remember sending it to you in it and thinking, oh, this isn't going to happen, you know, because it's got sort of just odd structure and because I hadn't really worked it out. And then <laughs> it's like, actually, we're doing that one next week. Yeah, I, I remember writing that quite quickly. Um, I think I wrote my parts in, I had a little studio in No I was kind of trying to get my sh shit together for the album. And that was one of the ones I was, I was cracking away at, but I'm kind of like hearing that I kind of wrote my bit to it and then they, you, you were recording it at Master Rock and I came in and listened to it and it just sounded amazing and you had the wor had that kind of word. Yeah, the word, well that's the, the Spud Stewart thing. Yeah, and, and it was really, really, and it texturally it was, it was kind of quite different to stuff we'd done before and I remember being very inspired by that mm. um, and thinking yeah this is going to be, you know, I really love the, the sense that this album is kind of like starting to spread just beyond four-piece band sort of thing, you know, it's kind of it's having those little suggestions. Hmm. Uh, and the, I really love the, the thing about the Volvo. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just, um, um, mainly because I was born in Stamford Hill. Am I allowed to say that these days? Or that, or say that if you want. But, but yeah, that's what, that's what I related to. I just thought, that's just so cool. Oh. It's writing about... About Volvos. <laughs> and kind of incidentally cornering the Swedish market, you know. But yeah. Animal Love is another one that, for me, it's, it was a great li uh, live song. It was the earliest sort of song that made it onto a record, I think. Yeah. Uh, playing to people, maybe. And it, it, it never really, it shouldn't have been on the album. It was a bit, a bit of a mistake. I think it was, it was there because it was, it was a mainstay of the live set, wasn't it? More I wrote anything. that riff when I was 15. Yeah. And it's just been hanging around since then. Yeah, we wrote, we wrote yeah. it really. I remember My writing first group. really, really early on. I, yeah, I don't think it's there's anything that exciting about the song. To, to be honest, really frank about yeah, it's it, it's a bit it's overproduced as well. That one definitely. I was listening to that this morning. It's got these maracas and all sorts of percussion going on. Stuff it used to be quite right. good. It used to be live. It used to be really one of those exciting songs and yeah, big chunky riff. Well. But yeah, it was um, yeah. So In your next life When we fly Away For good 
I think I wrote this at Angel, in Angel okay. Studios, and uh, I'd had a row with my wife, not for the first time, and uh, so I basically wasn't going home when somebody else was doing something, and they had a piano, a little room, Angel Studios is like an old church in Islington, and it had a little room up the stairs with an upright piano, really actually an upright piano, and I remember staying behind and messing about with it, and you coming in, and uh, when we were there, and, and saying, I really like that, remember that, and you recorded it on a dictaphone. Right. And I, I, I just uh, like made up with Elisa and, and went home and forgot about and it. We and then, it. then you played it back to me when, um, when we were on tour, and we were playing in somewhere like Middlesbrough or something yeah, like that. Yeah, it was, and there was a piano. And there was a piano there, yeah, yeah. And that guy, John Cheeves, took photos of us. I just remember the whole thing at the time, I remember playing that, yeah. and, and him taking photos, and you just singing the song, yeah. And I remember all of that. I also remember you saying that you'd quite like the album to end on something like um, After the Gold Rush Ends. Is it Cripple Creek Ferry or something? Yeah. Is it that the last song? And it's something that's like a yeah. little song. Yeah. A miniature song rather than a big band song. And I remember it was my birthday and you came over with a present for me once. This is so dull for everyone. Do you remember this? So this is what people want to hear, isn't it? I know, yeah. And I remember yeah, I playing, you played it, on the, I had a crappy old pan <laughs> piano in Morehouse Road, and you played it, and I, I sung you the part that I'd written. It was a book, I think. A hammer. <laughs> Toolbox. I don't know. Car remember. maintenance manual, probably. Flower or something. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to, I th well, really wanted us to be, I think probably, being a bit possessive, didn't want to, it to turn into, and now we're all going to jam together to write songs. Now we've got somewhere, and as being quite, us two are going to write a song, write great songs like this, you know, and whatever it takes. If it, if something comes up on a piano that doesn't need drums, doesn't need guitars, no guitar in it either. And it, you got to remember this point, I was the guitar player, and most people didn't know anything else apart from just it was a group and there's some guitar. And so I was quite hap quite keen for that to happen, to sort of, uh, I don't know. Um, I guess, again, you wouldn't have forgot that on, on Nevermind, would you? No. That's always a good criteria. Yeah. And, um, but I, f I remember playing at Jules Holland, and um, we did Jules Holland, and we did that. And I remember doing the sound check, and I looked up, and Brian Ferry was sitting at the end of the piano, just leaning over. And uh, I was like, all right. <laughs> you know, and, I remember, and at the same time, Jules Holland came over in the sound check and, and I, was, uh, I was talking to the sound guy about the piano, and um, about the sound of the piano. And he comes over and says, you all right there, mate? And I said, um, yeah, just it's getting used to the piano. It's a bit, you know, a bit Jules is special, Bosendorfer. And, uh, and him saying to me, yeah, saying to me, yeah, it's not one of these MIDI pianos, mate, you know? It's the real thing. You're probably yeah. used to a MIDI thing. Or keyboard. And I said, thanks. So there was him saying that and Brian Ferry saying that. And so, you know, is it any wonder I <laughs> went mad? <laughs> Things that stick in your mind, eh, Jules? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, Dolly's forgettable, to be honest. It was just something, we, a sort mm. of B-side we were writing. It's quite an early thing, wasn't it? We played it live a couple of times. We played it at the Underworld. Yeah, Dolly was quite exciting for the first rehearsal and the first couple of gigs and then sort of became way over excited. Yeah, it was sort of one that didn't quite work. But High Rising, however, is, is one of the best things we ever did. I yeah, think. I love High yeah. Rising. Yeah. I remember I had a cold when, we, when, we, uh, when, we, when I recorded the vocal and the, I, really, <laughs> yeah. I really liked the vocal on it. It's got, it's, it. There's something really rich about it, I think partly because I had a cold. You know how your voice sort of changes and gets all mucousy. You hide among the cover And wave as the aeroplanes go by There's nothing to say when you sleep all day But bye bye We kind of went into um, uh, West Side Studios, which is literally five minutes from where we are now, I think, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's around the corner. Oh, it's not anymore, I don't think. No, I think it's it was. gone. Um, it's and gone. to record it, and, and we went in. We had a song, because um, you'd written, I remember, we write, I, I remember writing my bit on, on tour when I was in Manchester, yeah. and I had a little dictaphone, I was sort of singing into it. 
trying to sort of like almost to create a kind of like a travelling studio thing. I had a, a portable cassette player and a dictaphone. That was my studio sort of thing. Um, and I wrote wrote my part, and then we, we kind of took it to the West Side. And I think it was. I think this is a real key key song in, in terms of what came what happened with Dog Run Star because I think this is very much you trying to trying to sort of write a, a big sounding song but without a, a, a kind of a, without a rhythm section really or traditional rhythm section. Yeah. You know, throwing lots of stuff at it. You know, I think mm. the harmonium is is really key part of the sound. It's lovely. Yeah, I remember I borrowed the keyboard from my brother, and it had a. a of this sound and I, re I remember recording this at home in, in my flat in Camden and um, and then but I didn't know what a harmonium was so when I really like Ed said this is the sound it's a harmonium I said well let's get a harmonium <laughs> I didn't realise what it was so it's you know harmoniums are pump organs but they're notorious because they're for being out of tune and creaky and noisy and and quite difficult to play if you've never you know literally from going from a midi piano to um, a Bosendorfer it is it's exactly that and uh, going to a harmonium, and I was just like Ted, well look, we'll get a harmonium, and I'll play it on that. And he, right, and I remember it taking half a day to get a harmonium, and then me saying, yeah, of course I'm going to play it. Just, just mic it up. I'm, just, of course I'm going to play it. And oh, it's terrifying, you know, because it's really hard work. It, it, you know, it was for the first time I'd ever seen one, and um, but um, but yeah, but it's good. And I remember getting a um, an orchestral. Um, bass drum in as well and whacking that and stuff. I mean it was when we were going on tour, we were going on European tour the next night. I remember Literally we left straight time. we left straight from the studio and we had like two days to do it. Yeah. And, um, I remember listening to it on the plane to Finland. Finland was, yeah, our first, was the first right, was yeah. the first gig of our of our European tour. Mm. We were listening to that on the on the plane. And we I mean we, to be honest sir, at that point we hadn't been rehearsing or anything, we'd just been doing stuff and uh, this song had come up. We if we'd gone into the studio, the fair thing to do to a group would be to we've got this song, let's go in and, and jam it out. That's what everyone would have done. And I really and I was really nervous of doing that because I felt that it wasn't I didn't think it was the right thing to do. It wouldn't benefit from it. It wouldn't benefit from it. And that's really hard to, to explain to other people when you're in a group, when there's four of you. And um but I just thought all the time well, I don't care, you know, in it just had to do the best thing, you know, the thing that, and that's, that's really hard. I think it put me in a really hard position. I mean, Ed encouraged me anyway, so that was, he was always on my side about that, that idea of just going in, let's create, partly because it meant he could create as well, because he could then get out the synths and stuff, or at least say to me, well, well try this out, or whatever. But it was, it was hard to explain that to the other two, I think, to get, it was hard to get away with it, and I think it became more difficult. But I really love High Rising. I yeah, really love the, the ending. It's really emotional. Yeah, it's, it, it's a great song. I mean, it, when you record like that, it gives you the opportunity to, um, to, to not be... You know, there's certain times when recording with people in a room at the same time is dynamically unbeatable. Um, it's, it's really magical and really hard to predict what someone else in the room is going gonna, is gonna to do to, to respond to what you're doing. And that's, you know, for certain songs that is... You, you, there's no replacement, but but there's certain times as well where we're actually building on what you've done on your own and doing it step by step. It, it also has this, you know has the same effect, and a lot of those songs um, worked like that. And um, and don't forget as well, I wasn't there when Brett was singing, you know, and so I'd, I'd be building bits of music, you know, with Ed and stuff, and then just assuming what would happen when he came in. You know, and, and, and also I guess from building like there's a big climax at the end of that song. And I think I just always assumed uh, that, well, <laughs> you'd, you'd, you know, Brett would get that and uh, know exactly what to do, you know, to pull that off. Um, that, that's quite a, that's quite a um, uh, confident situation to be in the group. I think it's a level of, of, of kind of um, almost uh, telepathy. In a way, when you when you're writing with someone, you know exactly kind of what you know. Bernard gave me a piece of music. I sort of know exactly what he wanted me to do out of it, sort of thing. I think he'd sort of trust me to be able to do that in a way. And lots of the things, even though lots of the vocal melodies, did, we didn't sort of sit and write together. You know, I think he, his suggestion of the kind of chords and where they were going would suggest, you know, 
there was, there was lots of left here. And things like Big, Big Time, that, that I think that was a real, you know, just the kind of the mood of it. And, you know, yeah. It just sort of suggested this thing and the, what the song should be about.